Hello, everybody. It's lovely to be back at Chairs. I uh, I wish that I was there in person with you instead of by video. I miss our, our in-person engagement. Um, here's what I propose to do this evening. Um, I will spend a little bit of time running through a few slides um, talking about the current state of the business, but I know that whenever I show up here, people have lots of questions, and so I will do my best to, to save uh, an abundant amount of time for questions um, at the end. Um, the, the, the short version of what's going on at Burford is that after having some COVID-related uh, slowdowns in the first half of 2020 in terms of new business, um, you saw new business really coming, coming storming back in the first half of 2021, as you can see in, in the growth of both commitments and deployments, which are on the, the two graphs on the left-hand side of the screen. We actually, um, we actually broke new records for both commitments and deployments in the period. Um, and that's in a world where the legal industry is not fully back to life. Um, and so we're really extremely pleased about, about how that went. Um, and at the same time, uh, as you can see in the bottom left, that contributed to an overall continued growth in the portfolio. I think it's worth stepping back and just, just realizing that, you know, I think I've been coming to shares since before 2016, if I'm not mistaken. And so we have, we have in that period seen 46% uh, CAG or 46% compound annual growth rate. Um, for our portfolio, which is fairly extraordinary, um, and it continues to grow. And not only does the size and scale of the business continue to grow, but as you can see in the top, uh, the top right corner, um, our returns ticked up a little bit in the period. And those are now returns that we're measuring over being able to return more than $1.7 billion in cash realizations to, to the business. So bottom line, um, slower, slower growth in realizations in the period, probably due to some COVID-related delays in trials and court appearances, very strong new business, overall growth in the business notwithstanding, um, and also robust liquidity. Um, not only did we close the period with $430 million of cash um, at the end of June, but shortly after the close of the period, a case that some of you have followed in the press called the Akhmadov case, um, was successfully resolved, and we received another $103 million from that case in, in early July. So this, this just shows the, the question of new commitments and deployments in more, more granular detail. And just as a reminder for those of you who are familiar with the business, and as a brief introduction for those of you who are new to it, our fundamental business is providing capital against the future expected value of legal claims. Um, a common way in which that occurs is that a corporate client will come along and say, gosh, I don't have the P&L tolerance, I don't have the budget available to pay the many millions of pounds that are now involved in, in taking a piece of complicated litigation through the process. Um, and as a result, Burford will come along and, and stand in the shoes of the client, um, pay those costs, pay those case costs, um, and in exchange, get a return from the ultimate outcome of the litigation. Sorry for that for one second. Um, and that's a business that is very appealing to corporate clients because they get the litigation expense off their P&L, um, which enhances their, their earnings and their EBITDA. Um, and it's attractive to us because we can build a large and highly diversified portfolio of these uncorrelated assets um, from which we're able to generate quite high returns. Um, the business as it has evolved has moved from not just covering the fees and expenses associated with, with litigation, but also monetizing underlying expected value. And that gives us yet more opportunities to, to provide value to shareholders and to deploy capital. And so you can see that going on here. Um, the, the top is uh, commitments and deployments across the, across the business and the bottom is just on Burford's balance sheet. And in both cases, you can see you know, meaningful levels of, of capital activity subject to that dip in the first half of 2020 when all of us were just becoming familiar with the, the, uh, the wonderful thing now that, that has occupied so much of our life in the last two years, the, the uh, coronavirus. 
So, and this, this sort of highlights the point that I was making to you earlier. We now have a $4.8 billion portfolio. Um, that is an enormous, well-diversified portfolio of litigation risk. Um, and what that, what that means effectively is that that is capital. Those are, those are investment matters that over the, over the years to come can be expected to produce returns for us. Um, and so as we grow this portfolio, we continue to set the business up for future returns. Um, and as you can see, we've had, there's, there's a, there's a multi-year lag in generating returns from this business. And so, as you can see, we're generating quite strong returns from a much smaller portfolio, which sort of then begs the question about, um, the potential of the business once those larger portfolio vintages come online. So this slide really illustrates the, the core operation of the business. And you start on the left-hand side we make commitments to underlying litigation matters. In other words, we agree to put capital behind their value. Um, we then deploy, we pay out most of that capital. Um, the reason for the gap between the level of commitments and the level of deployments is that some matters resolve themselves, settle before we, before we put out our entire commitment. And that then leads to three possible outcomes. We are effectively, once we put our cash in, we're effectively buy and hold investors. We're waiting for the outcome of the litigation matter. That's why our returns are uncorrelated because those results have nothing to do, the timing of those results and the outcome has nothing to do with economic or market conditions. It also means that there is a risk of volatility, of variability in the timing of our returns because we can't control them and we can't predict them. So we'll have periods with robust returns and we'll have periods with very slow returns. Um, and that's just the essential nature of the business. And as you can see here, the returns work themselves out over time. And basically, as we get to the point of these matters resolving, there are three possible outcomes. At the bottom, you can settle, which is the most common outcome 60% of the time. That's a great outcome because it removes any litigation risk. As you can see in that black box, it produces quite high, quite desirable returns. And that all happens in a relatively short period of time. Um, when cases don't settle and they go on to trial, then we're in the world of what we call adjudication, trials, arbitrations, and so on. And that introduces the concept of risk. We can lose, and when we lose, we'll lose most or all of our investment. But we win much more often than we lose. Um, and when we do win, we make about five times as much money as when we settle. It takes longer but we make more money and that's just logical because of course settlements happen at a discount and adjudications you can get your, your full size award. Um, and so the business is effectively a, a rolling up of those three outcomes to give the, the recoveries that you see on, in the red bar on the right. And those are cash on cash numbers. These do not include any accounting changes for the, for the assets. Um, so we have, as I said earlier, brought back more than 1.7 billion dollars in this business at, at the kinds of returns that you see there. What this slide shows you is a graphical depiction of all of our portfolio results over time and what you can see there is not only the dynamic that I was describing before around wins, losses and settlements but also the asymmetry between wins and losses and that just makes simple common sense. Nobody spends 20 million dollars litigating a case that's only worth $20 million. You spend $20 million to litigate a $100 million case. And what that means is that when we lose, we lose less than the money that we make when we win. And that kind of asymmetry is inherent to litigation. It's not unique to Burford. Um, and as we've shown with the number of matters that this applies to, these are repeatable patterns for us. This isn't just something that we've done once or twice as a matter of luck. And, and liquidity in this business, this is the cash that we have available to put into new investments. Liquidity for us is also at an all-time high, in part because of um, the successful resolution of matters and in part because we raised a new bond offering, our first ever bond offering in the U.S. market um, earlier this year, which was very well received, oversubscribed and done at a, at a reduced coupon from, from initial guidance. And, you know, as part of using debt in our structure, though, that debt is very conservatively run. Um, in fact, we have, uh, for years stretching out in the future, we're subject to a, a covenant in our UK bonds that restricts our debt to just half a turn of leverage. 
um, and we're well below that right now. We're just at 0.18 times, 18%. Uh, net debt as a percentage of tangible assets. So this is so we use some <coughs> excuse me some leverage in the business, but this is by no means a highly levered business. So just to sum up before I take your questions, um, we had a terrific first half in terms of new business. Um, we've continued to build on the size of the portfolio to drive both recent and future realizations cash flow. Um, our returns ticked up a little bit. Now we're running at a, since inception, a return on invested capital of 95%. We've got a strong liquidity position, um, you know, positive profit after tax. And our journey in the United States to, with our dual listing on the New York Stock Exchange, is continuing and will be moving probably to US GAAP reporting for year end financial statements um, as we continue to, to be appealing to investors in, in both markets. And with that, Roland, let me turn it back to you and uh, see if there are some questions. A lot of people are asking about COVID-related delays, um, court delays. Um, are you starting to see that situation ease? Um, what's the outlook? So COVID delays in litigation really take two forms. One is delays in cases actually going to trial. Um, and, and there you do see some delays, and, and understandably so. Court rooms are not well designed for things like distancing. Um, you know, people tend to, to sit sort of cheek to jowl. And so the throughput has simply declined in many jurisdictions because they don't have, you know, enough large courtrooms to, to meet the demand. On top of that, criminal cases tend to take precedence over civil cases, and so civil cases have some delays going on. And that, you know, that will work its way through the system over time. But I think it's important to understand that in our business, we're not like a restaurant or a hotel where if something is it doesn't happen today, it never happens. None of our cases have been discontinued. Every single client with an active case is continuing to press the, the litigation forward. Um, it's simply that the outcome may well take longer than originally anticipated. And that's not even necessarily a bad thing for us because in many cases, our returns include a time-based component that allows us to, to capture more economics as the matter proceeds. So that's sort of category one. Category two is that there were delays in the litigation process itself. Before you get to trial, there are lots of things that happen in a piece of litigation. You, you exchange documents, you take witness testimony and so on. Um, and that stage of litigation was interrupted by, by the coronavirus because, of course, people couldn't travel around. They couldn't go to their offices as easily. And so courts generally gave some extra time, some delays in those cases. But that isn't forever. Those are abating now because people obviously are coming back to life and are able to go, go back to work and back to their offices. Further to that, that, that point around the um, difficulty going to trial, um, does that have, or has that led to more settlements or, um, or and, and again, I think part of that question is also if that does lead to more settlements, is that a good thing or a, or a less good thing for you? It, it, actually, it actually is probably the opposite um, because when you think about litigation, what drives settlement in litigation is generally um, the threat of being close to going to trial. Settlements usually need some form of catalyst to occur. Um, if I sue A.J. Bell today and all that's happening in the case is we're exchanging some documents, there's not really a moment that is going to drive you to come to the table and negotiate with me as that's going on. What's going to bring you to the table is the fear that you're getting close to having to go to court and you could suffer a significant loss. Um, and so because we have to some extent removed in some cases that catalyst, we've actually probably also reduced the settlement activity level. They, they sort of work hand in hand. Um, but you know, in, embedded in that question was the somewhat broader um, you know, sort of question of, do you prefer settlements or do you prefer cases to go to trial because you make more money when they go to trial? But the answer there is that it's not something that we can predict or control. You know, you know, as a litigator, you know, I've, I've been I've been a career litigator in, in my time. You know that a lot of the cases are going to settle. That's just the outcome of litigation. Um, and you just need to accept that as as part of the landscape, as opposed to, to believing that you can affect it very much in either direction. 
And had people, quite a few people asking about the competitive landscape and people mentioning new and um, dedicated vehicles, quoted and unquoted law firms themselves, raising funds to address this market. Ha ha has the market got more competitive? And then further to that, how do you actually compete? What do you compete on? So Burford is is um, has the has the fortuitous position of being the market leader by a considerable margin, um, and and we do that because of a number of competitive moats that we have that range from our our sheer size and scale. Um, we have more than 140 people. About half of them are experienced lawyers. We're present all over the world. We work with more than 90% of the world's largest law firms. Um, and, and we have so many more cases, so many more dollars invested than anyone else that that gives us access to not only deal flow and relationships, but also proprietary data that improves our investment outcomes in our view. So there are a number of bases on which we compete. In addition to the fact that we're perceived as being so-called smart money, um, we do more than capital. We add value in the underlying litigation. In terms of the, the competitive dynamic, um, this is absolutely an industry of multiple players, and that's an excellent thing because it drives demand for capital. If this was a, if, if this were just the Burford show, you wouldn't see nearly the penetration of the concept of legal finance into corporations that that you do today. Um, you know, the, the specific reference to law firms raising capital, I'm I'm guessing, is a reference to uh, what was in what's been reported in London in the last couple of weeks is a sort of a well-publicized deal with Mishkan Dorea. Uh, one of the law firms in London that that you know is sort of doing a little self-promoting these days because it's it's contemplating a listing. Um, what I would say about that is that Burford is is by far the market leader in providing capital to law firms in forms just like the Mishkan arrangement. Um, we've got a couple billion dollars of portfolio business on our on our books right now, and so it's common for us to work with the world's leading law firms and to provide them with with capital that they can combine with their own to take on some risk. It's a significant part of our business. And so I view that as a market expanding thing, um, not as any sort of competitive threat. In fact, that's one of the ways that we have built our business because it effectively makes the law firms a marketing channel for us. Um, so we're, we're well pleased with where things sit as a, as a matter of competitive posture. Okay, and um, slight change in tech. Will the change to US GAAP GWAP affect the way in which you put a value on open cases? It will not. Um, the, the way that we um, value cases is just the same way as any other investment manager. So just the same way that a private equity firms like Blackstone or Partners Group um, go about valuing their investments is the same way that we go about valuing ours. Um, and it's a it's an entirely normal and, and frankly required aspect of both IFRS and US GAAP and the methodology that is used won't change under either system. Next, what are you doing currently to promote Burford in the US and to engage with potential US based investors? That's really got so, <laughs> yeah, we do. So we've we've had a good year, uh, notwithstanding COVID. Um, we you know we we launched uh, in on the New York Stock Exchange last fall, so we've been trading there for around a year now. Uh, about 25% of our trading volume is now through the U.S., which I think is pretty good in a year that um, you know didn't didn't allow for in-person roadshows or or a lot of investor education. We have dedicated investor relations resource in the United States um, with, with people who have deep specialty finance experience. And basically, the, the short answer is a, a bunch of virtual shoe leather, um, educating the market, talking to individual investors, um, you know, continuing to, to make people aware of the opportunity because there is no other uh, legal finance firm traded in the United States. And so this is both new to American investors and we're the only game in town once they decide they like the asset class. I'll read this one out in its entirety so I get the right um, terms. While I recognize that you are limited in what you can uh, talk about with the YPF case, given the court case is still proceeding, can you give uh, or can you update investors on the current situation in terms of next stages and likely timing in 2021 and beyond? Sure. So, so the the YPF cases are through what is called fact discovery. 
that ended at the end of August. It's the longest portion of U.S. litigation, and it's also the portion that is most susceptible to scheduled delays and disruptions. And so uh, we did have scheduled delays, uh, as I said earlier in that case, uh, but those are behind us, and, and we are done with the fact discovery part of the case. What's now happening is a shorter period of expert discovery where expert witnesses exchange uh, reports and have their, their testimony taken. That'll end at the end of the year. Um, in the beginning of 2022, there's a period of motion practice, what are called summary judgment motions, um, that, that attempt to frame the issues for the court. And right now, the, the case is scheduled for trial in May of 2022. Um, trial dates in U.S. courts are not fixed, and so the, it's up to the judge as she case manages the case to determine exactly uh, how the case will move forward. But the reality is that we're at the stage of the case where you would expect um, to start to see some substantive activity during the course of 2022. Thank you. Um, next question, moving on to the fund management division. Um, and a question uh, expressing the level of frustration with the um, uh, returns from the fund management division and question relating to um, the uh, paraphrase when when you expect to see performance returns that justify the price paid um, and the um, potential of that part of the business well so i think that those two things are frankly a little bit disconnected because i think the the acquisition that we made there had a number of benefits that went beyond a stream of fund management income um, it, it effectively was a combination of what were at the time the two largest legal finance providers in the country, complete with their relationships, their, their new business opportunities. We added, for example, because of that acquisition, um, lines of business that we were not in at all before. And so there's a, a meaningful strategic dynamic to that, to that business in addition to a, a dollars and cents cash flow dynamic. On the cash flow side of the asset recovery business, uh, sorry, the, the asset management business, I think there are two important points to make. One of them is that as to existing funds, um, we have already suggested that we're, we're looking forward to seeing a meaningful amount of future performance fee income from those funds. But just as the main business is both unpredictable and lumpy in terms of the timing of its realizations, so too is the, you know, the assets in the funds. And bear in mind that these are European waterfall funds, and so we don't get paid performance fees until effectively close to the end of the fund's life. So I'm still expecting meaningful cash returns from our, from our asset management business. That being said, the other thing that has happened in our business over the last few years is we have gained both significant scale and greater access to the capital markets directly. Um, and what that means is the ability to take on more balance sheet financing um, and keep more of the returns for shareholders. And just to put that in, in very blunt relief for you, when you think about the, the raw numbers here, when we have a, a, a so-called two and 20 fund, a fund in which we make a 20% performance fee on our, on, our, on our income, that effectively means that we're keeping 20% of the profits and we're paying 80% of the profits to fund investors in exchange for them giving us their capital. When I borrow money in the, in the debt markets at 6% or 6.25%, which we just did, and our cases take less than three years on average to resolve, my, my cost of capital is, is effectively 20%. And so we keep 80% of the profits for equity shareholders. So it's about four times as profitable for us to invest on balance sheet as it is to invest through funds with our high return investments. And so as we continue to have balance sheet capital, you know, thinking about favoring the balance sheet is a is a significant part of the equation as well. Lovely. The next question is about success rates, um, and you mentioned a 10% loss rate. How do you get that so low, um, and how many cases do you turn away? What, what's the filter process? So we look at between 1,000 and 1,500 matters a year, and we end up investing in a, in a single-digit percentage of them, sort of 4 to 8%. But b before you get excited about that as being you know, very selective, you should know that our goal is to increase that number and actually also, even though this will seem counterintuitive, to decrease the number coming in the top of the funnel. And the reason for that is efficiency. 
the reason that, that our, our case numbers are high and our close rates are low is because a lot of the things that we see still reflect a legal market where people are not quite sure how to use capital. And that makes it expensive for us because we have to spend time diligencing those cases and a little bit difficult with clients because we're saying no to a lot of clients. And so as the market continues to evolve and as we continue to educate lawyers about what will work as a capital proposition, we think we'll get more efficiency there. Um, you know, in just the same way that you wouldn't be happy if you were an investment bank and all sorts of people came through the door trying to get you to do their IPO when their company was nowhere ready for an IPO. Um, and you'd be unhappy about that because it would just take time and resources. You don't want to be saying no to 95% of the companies coming in saying, please, please take my company public. Um, but it's, but you don't have that same problem because people have a better sense of when companies are ready to go public. And that's what we're striving to get to in our in our business is to make that process a little bit more efficient and frankly get us to a get us to a higher close rate. But the first half of the question, I'm sorry, has gone out of my mind. It was not just about the close rate. It, 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 it was on the ten percent loss. I think the question is ten percent loss. How how, how, how do we do that? We, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I'd love to say that the loss rate is so low simply because we're really good at what we do. Um, that is, of course, part of it. But the other part of it is that litigation does settle routinely. Um, and so it's really a combination of those two things. It's a combination of us putting a lot of resources into a high quality market leading investment process that yields good results. But at the same time, it's also the structural dynamic around litigation that people will settle cases sometimes, even cases that aren't the, the five or the 10 percent strongest in the pool. Okay, and this is the final question, um, and again, I'll try and paraphrase this one slightly, so I hope it makes sense. Um, is, looking at the asymmetry of returns, is there a temptation to chase those very large potential value cases, and how do you um, manage that risk between the large and the, the, the general day-to-day kind of -day cases that kind of keep everything going? It, it's really actually the, the other side of the same coin as settlement. Um, when you think about what happens here, we're not in the driver's seat. When cases come in the door to us, we don't know if they're going to settle rapidly or if they're going to go all the way to trial. Um, and it's virtually impossible to predict that dynamic. And so what we do is look for the best investments that we can find. And those are the things that we, that we put our money behind. What then happens really depends more than anything else on the defendant in the case. Does the, does the defendant settle soon? Do they settle late? Do they settle well? Um, and the, the big cases, we can't really chase those big cases. Something turns into a big case when a defendant doesn't settle, misjudges the risk, goes to trial, and loses substantially. Um, and that happens on a regular basis in litigation, not only in Burford's litigation, but, but generally. But it's not as though at the beginning of the process, we're looking at these cases and saying, oh, well, this basket over here is going to be the sort of the, the middle ones that are certain to settle. And these are the ones that will go the distance and make us a lot of money. That's really not how the dynamic works at all. So we just make the best investments that we can. And inevitably, some of them will turn out to produce very high returns. Yeah.